My name is Brent. I'm the host for Canadians with Disabilities and Their Allies, and I bring together a whole broad range of people for uh, common um, issues and uh, discussions that we talk about on a regular basis here. And this morning, it's a great pleasure having three of you from the BC Autism Advocacy joining me this morning, uh, Michelle, Diane, and we're just waiting on Julian to join in. Yeah, so the main focus this morning is about clawback to individual autism funding and the creation of the Family Connection Centers. Ladies, I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe uh, tell the listeners what um, kind of what, what is going on with kind of the, 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 the BC following in the steps of Ontario and the, uh, the failed uh, the hub system that, uh, that's getting worked on there. Yeah, so um, just a little over a year ago, we just passed the one-year mark. It was October 2021. The Ministry of Children and Family Development announced the end to individualized autism funding and the creation of the Family Connection Centers. So as of 2025, all of our children that are currently receiving individual funding will lose the ability to have that funding and be forced into these Family Connection Centers. So what we've seen happen in Ontario just over three years ago, it was autism specific, whereas BC is going to be needs-based, no designation, diagnosis, assessments needed to be able to access services for all disabilities, which in the grand scheme of things, someone looking from the outside seems like, hey, that would be a really good idea. Unfortunately, like we've seen in Ontario, Currently, right now, they have over 55,000 children on wait list for services, and they're three years in. So what that means is children are going without services. They're going without early intervention, going without speech and language pathology from really young ages, when we all know is the biggest stage to have that development in their life and get that help that they need. And just recently, last year, the Ontario government actually said it was a failed project, that it's not working, they have to find something else. And now throughout what they're looking at, they're actually looking at going back to what we had, which is the individual funding. So it's, for us, it's a scary thing because of course our kids now are receiving their supports. They have their individual funding. They have their home teams that some have painstakingly taken years to build. And they're all going to lose that just overnight. And so that's what we're fighting for is, is to try and contain, retain our individual funding for our children, as well as helping the other disabilities expand into a funding type system, have the choice to be able to choose the home teams and get the supports that their kids need instead of shuffling them into centers where inevitably there will be wait lists. Yes, uh, I mean, 50, over 55,000 children on a wait list, that's incredible. And, and that's just unacceptable, really. Individual um, funding, I mean, is the, is the way to go. I mean, it's lived experience, right? I mean, parents, as you know, I mean, your parents with, uh, <laughs> with autism, uh, children with autism, right? And you, I mean, they, you would know best what's best for your children uh, rather than a hub system. Yeah, that's what we're fighting right now, you know, I mean, to have the choice for parents. I mean, if it was anything else, a parent can choose a, a child's doctor. A mm -hmm. parent can choose a child's therapy or treatments or activities that they do. And the parents lose that choice. We lose what we know best. We know our kids. We know them. We know what they need. And right now, the government's basically telling us, no, it's a government best. We, we know what's best for your children, even though they don't know our children. And as much as we tell them about our children, they still don't know our children. <laughs> I think the, the other thing is just that each one of us have set up our own parameters of what our child needs. And what Michelle's child needs is way different than what my child needs. Mm -hmm. Mine is 13. And she goes to a specialized special needs school, Kenneth Gordon Maplewood. And mm -hmm. that school gives her the speech therapy and the social emotional learning and tutoring to help her get through so that she can be a successful adult. So we're putting everything in one basket for her. And when we lose that funding, 
she will lose her community because her community is based on friends. It's based on teachers, everything. So it's quite expensive. So for us to take that and lose the funding, that means then we have to come up with that extra $6,000 a month to pay for, or a year to pay for her schooling. And the government has not come out and said what they're going to do for children that need tutoring to get them through so that they can be adults and so they can be successful, right? So there's, everybody's different. And that's why the, the individual funding is so important to each one of us is because of that alone. Each of us choose what needs the child needs. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, that's what the children are used to their surroundings. They're used to a, a normal routine of what, uh, what works best for them. As uh, parents, you would know also what, what they, your child is, is uh, you know, coping with in their life and what they're working with. And um, you're looking out for their best interest. And when you get a government who wants to call the shots and say, well, no, this is what's best. Uh, well, no, that's contradicting a parent, right? A parent knows mm -hmm. best what's, what works good for them and, and their children. I think that that's exactly that's that's I think been everybody's fight is the fear of what's going to happen to our children what each child needs and knows because mine didn't isn't where she is today because we just kept switching up everything you know she had a speech therapist for three and a half years same one same occupational therapist everything so for even to speak or to do anything. But if we go into these hubs, we're not assured that each one of us will see the same person every time we go to that hub. And if it's like the CDC or the Child Development Center, they only use give the children in blocks. So if the child uses up their blocks in six weeks, well, then they're sometimes put on a wait list for another six months to turn around and see maybe somebody else to get the same therapy. So now we're back to regression and these children need consistency. They need to always keep going in the inner direction and we can't put them on hold because somebody doesn't have the funding. Yeah. Like what is the, uh, like, what is the, the government's kind of their, uh, their view, like, um, like their kind of outlook on that like um have like the meetings like some of the uh, an overall <laughs> meeting like what are what's their excuse for it it's really funny you should say that because when it was originally announced last year it was announced with they would be helping 27 percent more or 8,000 more children every year now, when you look at the actual number of children who are actually receiving individualized autism funding it's approximately 33,000. An additional 8,000 children would mean that you're looking at just over 41,000. But when you run the numbers just from the BC education system, just what the Ministry of Ed says they have for designated children within the province, that's after five years old and right at graduation. So you still might have a year or two before you're actually aged out of the system. And we all know earlier intervention happens before five. So with those missing ends of the numbers, we're still at over 80,000 children. How can the government say that they're going to help approximately 41,000 children when we know for a fact that there's double that and more who need these services? They don't have, they, they haven't taken into consideration the budgets for it. The only budgets that have come out so far dollar wise speaking is for the changeover from the at home program, which is going to be the medical part of the new hub system. And the what was two pilot hubs and then grew to four pilot hubs that are supposed to be starting early next year. And through those budgets, like we, we don't even see how it's possible how it, even in the remote areas and things like that, how it's possible. The other thing that we did, BC Autism Advocacy did a service provider survey late last year, and then ACT and SFU did another service provider survey the spring of last year. And 
it's between 80 to 87 percent of service providers that said they won't work in hubs they won't work in these family connection centers it's unethical for them a lot of them are going to be taking a 30 to 40 percent pay decrease by working in the centers all the children if the government is not focused on this 100 percent all the way in and listening to parents and advocacy groups you name it then like is things are going to go completely sideways and as society they have to listen to uh, to parents that's number one and the, and the children especially when children are able to speak out too and they, they say like please like can you please listen um i was listening to one of us on tbc one time and it was uh, a young a young lad that said can you can you please listen to my mom and dad like yeah. and i thought wow like like what does that say like um there's there's a system is broken autism comes in so many different matters but it's generational in some families and if you don't help the first generation or the second generation it is going to continue to snowball into the next generation madison she's adopted but hers is generational and when i say that nobody helped her mom her mom unfortunately was abused by men madison is a product of the abuse and her life started out with her mom and then they took her at birth because nobody had helped like you know they were trying to help madison and her mom but in the end a couple of months later because nobody was there to help madison's biological mom the way they should have Madison ended up in care. She's with us and she's in good hands now. But if you don't help each generation, those kids turn into adults. And there goes the problem because then now medical starts kicking in higher gear because those kids need higher care if you're not helping them. And I think that that's what we're all so afraid of is, is that we don't catch our kids early in life and we don't help our children early in life what will happen afterwards and that we all have to look at our children as adults we can't look at our newborn child or our two-year-old who we know they're struggling already or their five-year-old who's just got their diagnosis we have to look at them from then on as an adult and what are we going to do to get them past adulthood so that they can count money or they can tell the time or they can get on a bus or do dishes. We all have that issue and we're all afraid of it. And the government unfortunately is making us more afraid. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that that's, you know, it's, comes down to like a theme that I use all the time on my shows is is lived experience right and it's um and it echoes throughout every aspect of life I mean for how it impacts uh, children with disabilities adults with disabilities um, there's uh, anyone can develop a disability in their life at any time I mean they're born with a disability and the government has to work with that situation and accept the fact that that population is growing there's more and more needs that need to be met to not ignored and kind of brushed off to the side and uh there's also you know i i call it ableism really i mean i'll just call a spade a spade right i mean that's um basically what it is uh because it doesn't affect them so they figure well i mean we know best and and that's completely ableist right uh government needs to get off that narrative because it's not working they gotta listen to parents absolutely 